This is my interview with Byron Lee, a 42-year professional photographer and camera store owner, and his favorite film and photography tips, and his favorite camera. And here we go. Hello, this is Jason, and um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, film photography and favorite cameras. And today we're going to be doing a little interview uh, with my dad, uh, Byron Lee, and um, talk about his favorite camera, why he chose it, and then um, we'll go from there. Anyway, uh, let's get started. But first, I want to have uh, my dad introduce himself and talk about um, his favorite camera and his photographic experience. So go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody. Hi, everyone. I'm Byron, and I'm just shy of 80, but I still love photography and take pictures every day and often use a film camera. But for family pictures, I, I use digital too, of course. But I got started in photography because my father was a photographer and came to uh, our little community here in Auburn in the 40s and uh, bought a camera shop and studio. So I kind of grew up with it. And so I always had the taste for the dark room. And uh, went away for school for a while, and my formal training in photography was I had the opportunity to go to the uh, Pasadena Art Center College for a few years and get my uh, formal training in photography. Otherwise, I'm pretty much behind the camera and behind the counter. And uh, I, uh, I love making images. I grew up in the era with... Uh, Ed Weston and Ansel Adams, where black and white was predominant. Bought all their books and read them. And so I always had an affinity for black and white. And we had a, a nice dark room in our, our studio and camera store, so I spent a lot of time in the dark room. And the dark room's still there, too. Dark room's still there, <laughs> still usable, yes, right. So I am. Uh, not in the dark room too much at this time, but I always think I'll go back into it. There's, there's something magical when you have a piece of paper and you put it in the developer and in the very low light you see this image start to form in your darkroom tray. It's, I don't know, I'm, even today I think it's, it's pretty much magic how that image forms on that piece of paper. And you time it carefully and decide when to take it out of the developer stop the action of the developer and put it in the stop path and fix it. And uh, then later turn on the darkroom light and, and see how it looks. And quite often you go back and do it again. But it's, it's part of the joy of photography. And you use film and the old chemical way. So when, when, uh, uh, when you had a family camera store, about how many hours did you spend a day in the darkroom? Well, I, I had the, the lucky privilege of having an after-school job at the camera shop, so, so I had, a, there were a couple of ladies who taught me the rudiments also in the darkroom. They were chief dark, darkroom uh, developers. At that time, we, we developed roll film, black and white, for all the drugstores around town. So uh, I spent a lot of time in the darkroom. And uh, enjoyed every minute of it. So one of the things I was thinking about when we were doing this interview too was the fact that um, unlike your dad, my grandpa, you and I have a similar experience because we both grew up in a camera store. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So what? When? Um, what was your favorite part of about that? Well, it was it was fun to sell everything from the simplest little inexpensive Kodaks to all the way up to really high-end kind of cameras, so we got a vast experience in doing um, a little bit of everything, but I, I like selling cameras and explaining cameras to people, and uh, these were all film cameras, of course, at this time. You learn how to show people how to load the camera and, and things like that, and learn the basics of f-stops, and apertures, and shutter speeds, and then if they're more interested, then they'll They'll ask questions about composition and things like that. So we, that was that was I think the most enjoyable part. Yeah, I always thought that, that when someone came in and bought a camera from us, 
and we explained to them. It was the, the trick was telling them a little bit of information, but not too much, because they get overwhelmed and be like, "Oh, I can't do this." So <laughs> yeah, that's very true, especially on your, your some of your more premium cameras, which were more complicated every year. It seemed like. Mm -hmm. So now, what was your earliest memory of you using a camera? Um. Well, I think my mom and dad gave me a little box camera uh, when I was young. We used roll film, I think it was 127, and it was a Kodak. I, I'm trying to remember the name, I think it was something called something like a Holiday. <laughs> you know, it had some Kodak name, and uh, used, at that time, I think a 127 film, which is a small spool of film. But it was easy for me to load and so on. And I, I probably was about maybe seven or eight, somewhere in there, I would guess. And of course, as soon as you have a camera, you use a lot of film because you want to see what happens with it. So you try it on everything. So. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, I mean, I remember going through just cartridges of film on that little little Kodak X50 that you guys got me. That's right, yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. a 126 cartridge. And yes. uh, I still have, in fact, I've got to go through the old Albums and pull some of those out and take them because they had pictures of I took when I was in kindergarten. I kind of mm -hmm. think it's cool. Okay, so tell me about the your out of all the camera. Well, what I should ask is, what cameras have you owned through the years? Which ones that kind of trigger the most that you liked or you just used? Maybe used for a while, gave up. What what was the series of cameras you, you used? That's a, that's a hard question because being in a camera shop, you know, you get to choose and see them all come in and play with them a little bit before they go on the shelf. Uh, I guess I like them all, <laughs> but in, uh, when I grew out of the little simple roll film cameras and moved to 35 millimeter, I think uh, I started out using cameras like Pentax. They were fairly simple. To, to load and operate, and I was probably a teenager then, and uh, I, liked, I liked the Pentax really well. It was well constructed and, and uh, could take a little bit of abuse. I liked to hike and so on, so throw it in my, my backpack, it was, could take it. And then I, I loved the, the German cameras, but they were still at that time a little bit out of my price range. The cameras like your Zeiss Icons and Contraflexes and Voigtlanders, uh, they were beautifully made and nice to handle and everything, but um, they were just more expensive. So I, I didn't have a camera like that for quite a while. And then I liked 120, and my dad would take me on weddings as a, a helper to load cameras and to hand him, at that time we were using 4x5 sheet film black and white and I would oh. hand him the 4x5 holders and these were large holders with film in them and then I moved up to where I could help him a little bit more and he gave me a, a roller cord now the roller cord was a German made camera it was a little lower price than the roll of flex that uh, we started using. And the roll of flex is a twin lens camera. It had two lenses, it looked like a box, but it was very commonly used by wedding photographers and portrait photographers. So I would do kind of the group shots and fun shots, you know, candy things, helping me, and uh, that kind of thing. And then Pretty soon then, uh, we, were, we were doing enough work in portraits and all that kind of thing that he got the, my dad got the bite of a Hasselblad. And Hasselblad was the prime camera of, of the, the really what we thought great photographers. And uh, they, uh, the Hasselblad was made in Sweden and it was very interchangeable. Had interchangeable lenses and the lenses were Carl Zeiss, which were made in Germany. And you could literally take this camera apart and end up with a little box. And it made it very desirable for all kinds of use. So then we moved into Hasselblad. And then uh, these were really nice tools to use. And 
basically you, all those hot salons that you use for weddings, we you still have them. All I have many of them. Yes, because we were we eventually became we we're getting big enough. We became a hot salon dealer, and that was just like being in a candy store, of course. <laughs> yeah, because we had all this beautiful equipment, and so we sold cameras to hot salons in the store. And then we use them in portraits and commercial work and weddings and school photography, all kinds of things like that. These cameras took roll film, uh, a film uh, we called 120s, similar to what this looks like. And uh, so that's, that's and it, as it turns out, and then of course Hasselblad ended up being my favorite camera. And we ended up just having about every model they made. So. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how many Hasselblads do you still own? <laughs> I think we still have about six cameras in our collection. They're all in good working order. We have electric drive models that we use in the portrait studio. And we have uh, more uh, the small cameras we use in the field for weddings and commercial work and things like that. And then we had specialized cameras like this one you sit on the table, which is called the Hasselblad Super Wide. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's the one. And out of all the cameras you ever used, this is your favorite. It is. The Super Wide is the most remarkable camera. You can see it's reasonably compact for a 120 camera, but what makes this camera so remarkable is the lens. It uses a wide-angle lens, equivalent in 35 millimeter uh, reference to a 21 millimeter lens. And normally, 21 millimeters in the 35 format would be uh, give you some distortion on the edges, the following away look kind of thing. However, on this camera, that's not true, and the reason that's not true is because. The film plane and the lens are extremely close together. You can see the lens here, and in the magazine, this is the film plane. So you get undistorted quality of pictures. And like all Hasselblads, they come apart. And this being the magazine, this is the, the finder, and this slides off. And then the magazine looks like this. You have a key, they call it the key, and you have a dark slide. You can pull the dark slide out, and the key opens the magazine, and this is where the film goes. These are the parts. So when you take this camera apart, you see you don't have a whole lot of camera. This, it's pretty small. So to load this camera, we take an empty spool, 120 spool, and we put it in the side where there's a neural knob, which is this little business. And we put it in there. Now we film, the 120 spool film goes on the other side. And the idea is that you load this film and it kind of backwinds. And that I will demonstrate. Put the film in the holder, and the film comes back around this way. So we take it like this, and there's a little metal holder here, and this key opens that. Pops open when you turn the key, and you slide it under the little holder. And then you can turn the key back to help hold it down as you're loading it. it has quite a bit of curl, this film does. You slide it in, and then you use the knob to pull the film around, keeping your kind of your finger on it to guide it. Now we are loaded. You can kind of see how this is. Next, we load it into the magazine. It's kind of it's precise, so you have to kind of jiggle it around a little bit, and you lock the key so it can't come out. You take your dark slide, you put it in the slot, slide it all the way in, and then you push your key down. Now we still have paper there, so we need to get to the number one position. There's a little 
indicator right here. So this is what this little crank is for. And then we crank it to number one. And it'll stop at number one, and then you can lock it down. Like so, just get it out of the way. Now you have real film behind this dark slide. Putting your magazine back on the camera, like so, lock it down. So if you want to take a picture now, you pull the dark slide out and you're ready. You can set your shutter speed and focus. But because this camera has such tremendous depth of field, in other words, things sharp, both near and far, it almost becomes a camera that's just like a box camera. You don't have to do anything except click the shutter. You can preset it. And that is what makes this camera so remarkable, because it takes extremely sharp pictures of the Carl Zeiss wide-angle lens. Now, on this camera, one of the questions that's come up when people ask me about the Hasselblad is the EV system. Can you explain how that works on that lens? Well, the EV system was something that was started long ago to help make exposure easy. Exposure EV being exposure value. That's what these red numbers are. So if you have a bright sunny day, you can set the little sliding scale here on 14. And that's considered kind of a nice bright sunny day. Then you can adjust your shutter speed and aperture just by turning this knurled knob back and forth. So you can go high shutter speed, low shutter speed, bigger aperture. But for example, we are set right now at 250th of a second at f8. Now we have a focus range of anywhere from infinity down to seven feet, and you'd never have to refocus it. And I can guarantee you, you will get incredibly sharp pictures within that range without even having to focus. So it makes it a camera you can just click, wind, quick, click, wind, and it can be very rapid. So tell everybody about what your photographic background is. Well, I kind of grew up in the dark room, um, when I was a youngster, I worked in my dad's uh, Photoshop and in the dark room, and and uh, always loved photography. And we kept uh, developing more film. And I would work even when I was young behind the counter. And then I went to uh, college for a while, and but I got my formal training in photography from the uh, uh, Los, Los Angeles uh, Art Center. School of Design in uh, in LA for a couple of years, and and uh, but most of my background is from working behind the camera and, and helping people and working around the camera shop. So, what would be your your pro tip for people wanting to begin shooting with film? Just because there's this huge resurgence of people wanting to shoot film again and bringing up their their old film cameras and trying to find people to repair those old film cameras. But for those people who are, who are just getting started, what is like your, your best advice for them in learning this medium? Well, when using film cameras, I think maybe the best thing to, to learn is patience because film cameras are a little bit slower to both load and to operate. But that what is one of the factors that makes them so desirable because you're able to think about the composition, the image that you're trying to take. And if you can slow down a little bit, you're liable to have, and think about your image, you're gonna liable to have a much better image that you'll be happy with. So with, with using film cameras, that ability to slow down gives you also the ability to look at composition, would you say? Oh, absolutely. Sure, because you're looking through a viewfinder and then you raise your head and you look at your, your situation and you say, well, is that exactly what I, I want to capture on film? And uh, I, I think it allows you more concentration on your composition. And if you take some of the old masters like Ed Weston and 
Ansel Adams, you know, they would they would pre-visualize their images before using their large sheet films. And so they'd hold up their hands like this and, and kind of pre-visualize. So it was a more time-consuming kind of photography. So I know in, in the camera store, one of the brands that we carried and was real most prominent on our shelves for years was Yushika and Contacts. Yes. And you still have and use these little compact contacts because mm -hmm. right now um, the little contacts tees are like hyper sought after. Everyone wants these cameras. So can you talk a little bit about the contacts and your sure. use of the contacts cameras? Well, contacts is a famous name, of course, in, in uh, German camera making. And Yashika revived the contacts name and bought some of the rights for that name. But contacts use Carl Zeiss lenses, which are made in Germany and are still made in Germany today uh, for specialized cameras. And uh, the Contacts uh, brand, they, when they brought these cameras back, they made them beautifully. Some of the cameras were made out of titanium bodies, so they're very durable. They're very small, sleek. They, were, they hired Porsche's design uh, team to uh, design these cameras, so they have a very desirable look to them. So they're, they're a beautiful camera. And uh, I still... I still keep a couple in my drawer. I have uh, the little Contacts T and the T2, and uh, they're beautifully made cameras. They're fun to put film in and, and take. People uh, ask you if you're using the cameras, well, what kind of a digital camera is that? <laughs> but uh, I say, no, this is a film camera. So they're quite impressed that uh, companies made beautiful uh, film cameras like this. You know, okay. Yep. So out of all the contacts cameras that you own, because I know that you use the 35 millimeter contacts as well, what of those were your favorites? And do you still have any contacts cameras today? Oh, like yes. 30, big 35 millimeters. Yeah, I, I still own quite a few contacts cameras. I own the original RTS just because I kept it for historical reasons. This was a more professional caliber camera. And then they had the RTS-2 and the RTS-3. And uh, I kept the RTS-3. And uh, then they made some specialized cameras like the uh, S2, which is a titanium uh, skinned camera that was small and compact and beautifully made. And uh, then they made some uh, other cameras like the Aria, which was a, had a, a nice finish to it. It had a rubber based handle. You know, it was a beautifully made camera also. Everything that uh, Contacts had was, was very beautifully designed. Do you still have an Aria? Uh, I believe I do. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure because I, I remember that. Um, I mean, I I love my AX mm -hmm. for the short time I use it. Well, yes. I used the AX for a while. You did. But I got kind of tired of the autofocus being really slow. It was slow. But <laughs> it's funny looking back at it now. I wish I had kept it. <laughs> well, yeah, they're <laughs> really rare. <laughs> oh yeah, I should have kept the AX because yeah. it, it, I always thought it was cool because all the manual focus lenses became autofocus lenses when you put it on that body. That's right. I always thought that was cool. It had but, back focus. Yeah, it was the system. entire inside of the camera would slide mm -hmm. on this ceramic railing system to focus. Right. It was really complicated, but it was a nice camera. Yeah. It was kind of fun to use. Big and heavy, but... Oh, yeah. Beautifully. Yeah, that's that was that point where, you know, Canon was coming out with digital cameras and I had switched yep. to Canons for the weddings yes. and portraits. Uh, and, and I mean, I don't regret it. I love the Canons, but um, still do. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's that was my big camera switch. Right. So, but you've always stuck with Hasselblad, though. Yeah, when I'm taking a trip or out in the field or I'm hiking, I like to take the Hasselblad. It's just the right format for me. It's a little bit bigger film than 35 millimeter, and it, uh, you can set it on a tripod and look through it or you can use it portably it's i don't know i just always been fond of those cameras so with the with the Hasselblad and contacts and and through using cameras and lenses why did you because it looks like you know you've got the contacts with the zeiss lenses you've got the Hasselblad with the zeiss lenses why did you gravitate towards using zeiss opposed to something like leica for example or some of the leica stuff what what made you choose the the zeiss glass over anything else well they had a reputation of being the very best and of course 
a Leica, or Leica also made top-notch lenses, but Leica had a much narrower focus on uh, basically rangefinder cameras, and they were flat out difficult to load. While the Zeiss range of the cameras, lenses that, that uh, Zeiss made for cameras were like Contax and Hasselblad, they were much easier to load, they were more conventional. So uh, that's, you know, there's, there's a lot of competition at that time with uh, the very best of the German lenses, but um, uh, Zeiss always were very good. Mm -hmm. And I know with, with I, I, when I switched from using Canon stuff, and I love my Canon L series glass and all that, but one of the reasons that I picked to use it going from using the Canon lenses and I went to Sony was the Zeiss. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing I like best because I could take all those old Zeiss lenses that you had kept for the contacts and use them on those. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty neat way, way to do that. You're right. Yeah. And one of the things I've been having fun doing recently is using the old vintage class on the Sony again. Mm -hmm. So I brought out a lot of those old ones to start using them yeah. again. Yeah. Now, for the most part, even though you do still shoot film, you do shoot digital though, right? Absolutely. Sure. For, <laughs> for family pictures and children and uh, being, you know, quick, quick things you need to photograph quick, quickly, the digital is the way to go. But uh, if you want to concentrate on, co on composition and uh, you work really on a, a special image, I don't know, there's something awful appealing about film still. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so your digital camera that you use for your personal stuff, what are you using right now? I use the Canon system and that was introduced to me by my son, Jason here, mm -hmm. and who, uh, <laughs> who thought Cam Canon was very good because Canon is very good. And, uh, not that Nikon isn't or any of the other makers at uh, Sony, but uh, yeah, they have a, a large range of products. So I, I use the current Canon system. Okay. So for the, the people who are, who are coming from digital and they've been shooting digital their entire life, and now they're starting to shoot film again, what's something that a, a digital to film photographer need to know about how film works? Because film is a different, it captures light a little bit differently. Well, I feel it does. What do you think is something someone shooting film needs to know, or digital needs to know about shooting film that maybe they don't know about? Well, probably the first thing is that it doesn't have the speed that digital does. In other words, the light gathering ability, um, the sensitivity on film is much slower. So you're going to... Uh, not be able to shoot in near dark conditions as you're used to shooting with digital. That's that's one thing that's really important. And uh, but I think if you're shooting black and white in film, you're probably the sensitivity of black and white film. I believe is 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 very sensitive and maybe better than digital black and white. But that's a personal opinion. Mm -hmm. And. Um do you enjoy printing your own work when you're shooting black and white, or do you still like to go in the dark room? Or do you, do you... Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's the magic of the dark room, I think is really fun. And uh, as long as I've been in photography, and I've worked a lot in the dark room, uh, still I'm, I'm totally amazed about uh, putting that piece of paper, that sensitized paper in the developer, and watching with a red light on, just very dim light, and seeing that image come out at you is really magic to me. And <laughs> taking it out and putting it in the stop bath and fixer and then turning on your bright lights and having a look. And I don't know, there's just, there's something special about that. Mm -hmm. And with, so like on a normal day at the, at the camera shop, you know, it, it, when we were doing a lot of the darkroom stuff ourselves. Mm -hmm. About how long, how much of your day did you spend in the darkroom? As much as I could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would normally work in the mornings doing orders uh, in the darkroom. And uh, so I was in the darkroom until about lunchtime. Trying to, we would do a lot of 
copy and restoration in black and white. And uh, we would do a lot of publicity photos and at that time, passport pictures and identification pictures and, uh, before digital came along. So I, I spent a lot of time in the darkroom. Yeah. Yeah. So about, you know, would you say you spent about four hours a day? Every day in the dark Pretty rooms. Close. Well, we were, Pretty you know, close. we were open five days a week or six days a week, really. Yeah. And so most of the five days a week, you were in there four hours a day, five days a week yeah. for how many years? Uh, well, <laughs> close to 42 years. <laughs> right. So that's a lot of dark room time. It is. Yeah. So you, you know your way around the dark room. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, in the dark room that, that is that you still are able to use, mm -hmm. um, what enlarge, what's your equipment that you use in there? What, what enlargers do you use in there? Well, we, we, have, we use a variety of enlargers, Omega and, and Bessler, but Bessler is my favorite enlarger. <clears throat> it's a 4x5 enlarger, so you can use large sheet film, 4x5 sheet film, all the way down to the tiniest little uh, black and white image, or negative. So, and it, it goes from floor to ceiling, but that's the main on larger we use and uh, we have various lenses for it and uh, has some motorized carry so you just press a button and the lens and bellows go up and down so it's fast and easy and it's always been very reliable. So do you think that, that new film photographers, let's say if they're shooting black and white, do you think that part of their journey into photography should include the darkroom? Oh I think so because that's where the magic happens and as far as I'm concerned, yeah. And you start out by just developing a roll of black and white film. And uh, you can get what we call daylight tanks, so you only have to load the film in a reel in total darkness. And then once you have your lid on, then you can turn the light back on and pour your chemistry or your developer in there and, and finish the procedure that way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think part of the whole fun of doing film is doing black and white and developing the film. Yeah. Yeah, that was always a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks for watching, and if you want more information about my work or anything else, just go to jasonbyronlee.com. Thanks again for watching.